number 13, and our text today will be verses 1 through 3. I'll have you turn there at this time, and once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right. The Apostle Paul is writing, and by the Holy Spirit says, verse 1, This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. <laughs> I wish we could just close in prayer and leave it at that, but <laughs> let's ask God's blessing on our understanding, if you would join with me in prayer. <laughs> oh Lord, the intensity with which Paul writes this to the Corinthian church is such that we need for your Holy Spirit to enable us to understand why it was deemed necessary to record in scriptures for us at this time as a church, as your people. Lord, obviously there's something here that you want to minister to us and show to us, so we need for you to do that at this time. Will you, Lord? We're asking you, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is going to be part one of a series I've titled, What True Love Is and Does. As we just read in the first three verses of this last chapter here in 2 Corinthians, and as we're about to see, the Apostle Paul is writing about what will now be his third visit to the Corinthian church. Paul's first visit took place when he originally planted the church and stayed there in Corinth for what would end up being about a year and a half. We know this because of Acts chapter 18, verse 9, where it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. And the Lord had revealed himself to Paul in a vision because there were many there that were threatening to kill him. And he was fearful. And this is interesting because you don't imagine the Apostle Paul being fearful. But he was. And this is why the Lord appears to him in a vision and says to him, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city, speaking of Corinth. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. That was his first visit when he planted the church. Sadly, though, Paul's second visit was a very brief one. It took place between the time that he wrote his first and second epistle to the Corinthians. And the reason his second visit was so brief is because it was riddled with conflict, striving, and uh, just carnality. And that was really the main reason it was riddled with such conflict. It was really because of the carnality on the part of the Corinthians. And this is one of the reasons that Paul says what he says here, and really in the way that he says it, in advance of his third visit, and it also in some way explains why it is that Paul is so seemingly harsh and blunt in the way that he says what he says. And that's the question I think that's before us today. Why? Why is the Apostle Paul so blunt with them? 
Why does he write so harshly to them? And here's another question. (laughs) Why does Paul even want to visit them again? Listen, I, I can take a hint after my second visit. You know what? No. <laughs> Why would I want to go back and visit a church that just brought me nothing but sorrow and grief and pain? Why would I want to go back a third time? Is Paul being a glutton for punishment, as we say? Here's the answer, it's in a word, love. That's why. What do you mean? Well, Paul loved these Corinthian Christians so much. In spite of their carnality and in spite of the fact that it wasn't reciprocated. That's why he writes and says to them in the previous chapter, chapter 12, he says, why is it that the more I love you, the less you love me in return? I really believe that these Corinthian Christians really hurt the Apostle Paul. And again, you don't see maybe the Apostle Paul as being someone who would be so hurt. I mean, You, like me, I'm sure, imagine him to have really thick skin and just this unflinching fearlessness and toughness. But I really believe that Paul just had such a tender heart and he had such a special place in his heart for these Corinthians. The only other church that he spent as much time with and even more time with was the church of Ephesus. The church of Corinth, more than any other church other than the church in Ephesus, the apostle Paul spent the most time with, a year and a half with. I would submit that love is the only answer that explains why Paul would even bother writing them. It's also the only answer that explains why Paul would now want to even visit them for the third time. Think of it this way. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't bother. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't even bother writing them, let alone visiting them. This is the only thing that explains why it is that Paul would even do this. I see Paul's love for them as being the real deal, if you will. This was real love. This was true love. This was an unconditional love. This was agape love. And certainly it was brotherly love. He loved them so. And as such, he was willing to do anything and everything in order to get through to them under the banner of his love for them. Certainly, Paul was not concerned about whether they liked him or not. I mean, that becomes abundantly clear. And what's also abundantly clear is that his chief concern was for their spiritual growth. He only cared about their spiritual maturity. And as we're going to see towards the end of the chapter, he basically says to them, you guys need to grow up. (laughs) You guys need to grow up. You need to mature in Christ and grow in grace. The indication being that they were spiritually immature and they needed to grow up (laughs) and become men and women of God. That was his chief concern. Even if it meant that they despised him for being so blunt, for being so honest, he was still willing to be hard on them because of 
his love for them. It's with this introduction that we come to the first thing that I want to talk about today in terms of what true love is and what true love does. And it's that of our willingness to speak truth to each other. In verse 1, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, saying that on his third visit, everything must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then in verse 2, he <laughs> says that because he's already warned them twice, and now this will be the third time, when he comes, he will not spare anyone who has sinned earlier or any of the others they've already been warned he's warned them once he's warned them twice and now this is the third time and we're going to see the significance of that detail here in just a moment in verse 3 he says since you're demanding proof that Christ speaks through me which they had, of course, by virtue of the super apostles, so-called, accused him of not being a true apostle. He says, uh, like Christ, I'm not going to, though se I seem to be weak, <laughs> I'm going to deal with you very powerfully. I'm going to be very strong with you. I'm going to be very tough on you. I'm going to be very severe with you. Boy, how would you like to be on the receiving end of a letter like that? Think about that. What if I showed up at church one day and I said, you know, um, I want to begin by reading a letter that I received from the Apostle Paul. Uh, we're going to have him as a guest speaker. He's going to be coming back to Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe. <laughs> And uh, you might want to hear what he has to say about this upcoming visit of his. Um, that would be pretty interesting. Well, that's the problem, though. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the most dismissed and disobeyed truths in all of scripture, this would have to be it. And I'll explain what I mean. It's that of our unwillingness to warn that brother or sister in Christ concerning their sin, especially if and when they sin against you. The reason for this is that oftentimes it indicates that we simply don't care enough or love them enough to tell them the truth. That's the reason. I'm hoping you'll kindly permit me to take you on a brief tour through scripture. I wanna visit some of the places where we're told why we're to do this, and even how we're to do this. And I want to start with Proverbs 27, verse 6. It says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In other words, if you're my friend, you will speak truth to me, even if it hurts me. It can be trusted. I know you're a trusted friend because you care enough about me to speak truth to me, knowing that it could be very wounding to me. You're my friend. Conversely, you're not my friend. In fact, you're my enemy. If you only tell me what I want to hear, Dare I say, as a pastor, 
I would be your enemy if I only told you what your ears are itching to hear. I'm no friend, and I'm certainly no pastor. If I love you, if I care about you, I'm going to speak the truth to you knowing full well it's going to hurt. But it's a good hurt. And it leads to a good end. The wounds of a friend are faithful. They can be trusted. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't bother. I know my wife loves me. You know why? (laughs) Not because she cooks for me. Washes my dirty clothes for me. Not because of those things that she does for me. No, because of the truth that she speaks to me. She'll tell me. You're not really going to leave the house looking like that, are you? (laughs) Now, why does she tell me that? Does she hate me? No. She loves me. How about this? And I confessed this on Thursday night, so I want you to know that my heart is right before the Lord. I have repented when it comes to food. My wife will say to me, and it's very hurtful, by the way, because I love food, especially meat, red meat, medium rare, kind of juicy, and (laughs) it's of God, by the way. I just want you to know that steak will be in heaven. I'm just saying, because it's in the Old Testament and they would barbecue and I digress. But anyway, getting back to the matter at hand, (laughs) my wife will say something to me like, you're not going to eat that. Well, that's kind of mean. No, it's not. She loves me. She's concerned for me and my health at 55 years of age going on 80. (laughs) Reminds me of the story that's told where the doctor says to his patient, your heart is good, you're in really good condition, you're very strong, and you're in perfect health for a man of 90. (laughs) That's how I feel sometimes, but... Now, I suppose I can look at it this way. Um, Maybe I would be really concerned if she says to me, hey... (laughs) I just barbecued this artery hardening steak and I want you to eat this for the next month every night. (laughs) By the way, how much is that insurance policy again? Maybe a silly way to illustrate it. She loves me. My wife wants me to be around. (laughs) We have a prayer and a saying in in Arabic that goes basically like this, Lord, keep them for me and me for them. Keep them alive for me and keep me alive for them. I know she loves me because she'll speak the truth to me. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Quite a picture here, isn't it? Picture two knives sharpening each other. Imagine the friction and the heat created by that sharpening process. There are those times, and especially in the context of the marriage relationship, where the friction, the heat, is good. In marriage, the, the friction, the heat in this incompatibility by God's design is meant to bring those things out and to remove those things that have no business belonging in the heart of that husband and that wife. When my wife and I were first married, we had many conflicts And God used that friction and that heat to remove those things that had no business taking up residence in our lives, let alone our marriage. 
Ephesians chapter 4, this is perhaps amongst my favorite passages in all the Bible concerning this matter. I'll read verses 11 through 16. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, and by the way, as I read this, you'll have to bear with me as I try to keep and not, and not lose my breath. It's all one sentence. This is all one sentence. I, when I was studying and preparing and reading and meditating on this passage, I uh, found myself getting my asthma back because it's so, it's just, so bear with me. He says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, immature, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, I wonder if he had those super apostles, apostles in mind, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but here it is wait for it <laughs> speaking the truth in love may grow up grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, growth of the body, for the edifying of itself in love. Wow. Try to unpack that. <laughs> by the way, um, after 2 Corinthians, we go into Galatians. And then, you know, the book after Galatians, Ephesians. I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, especially when we get to chapter 4. Plan on this being a series in and of itself. <laughs> just this passage that we just read now. What's Paul saying here? He's saying we're all different parts of the same body. And there is this danger even this propensity for the body to be dysfunctional. Let me illustrate this way. You know when the writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I think some translations render it gathering. Poor translation. I'll explain why in a moment. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the custom of some. It's an interesting Illustration, the best I ever heard was this. It would be like taking a watch and gathering all of the parts together. Merely gathering them does nothing. They need to be assembled in order to function, to serve any purpose. This is why all of us as different members of the same body, we can be gathered together, but until we're assembled together, no growth takes place. There's no functioning. Nothing happens. And that's what Paul's saying. We're all different parts. We've been given different gifts. And for the edification of the body, every part of the body has to do its own share for the growth of the body. And when we're assembled together and we're functioning as we should, then the body is edified. And isn't it interesting that the body is edified in the context of speaking the truth in love? You know what that means? <laughs> it's not just from pulpit to pew. It's between you and you. I'm sorry if I pointed at anybody in particular. I probably shouldn't do that. In fact, I would venture to say that in some ways, more ministry takes place after the sermon than is the case 
during the sermon? How do you know that that brother or sister in Christ doesn't have a word fitly spoken for you concerning that situation that you're in, concerning that decision that you're praying about? There have been many times, many years before I got into the ministry where just fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters in Christ, God would speak to me through them and even answer a question that I had been petitioning the throne concerning. Never underestimate a functioning and healthy body that is assembled together, each part doing its own share. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. This is actually, I'll call it, a template specifically directed more in the area of church discipline, but the principle itself is true across the board. Jesus is speaking, and this is what he says. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Stop right there. <laughs> You'll forgive me. We don't do that, do we? Let's be honest. Between you and me and the Holy Spirit. Let's be honest. Someone sins against you. Somebody says something about you. Somebody gossips about you. And you hear about it. Do you go to them? No. You go to everybody else. And here's the thing, when you do, what you'll find is the person who sinned against you, they haven't gone to you either. They've gone to everybody else but you as well. <sighs> well, let me continue. Maybe I'll try to explain this more in a moment. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But, verse 16, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more established in the presence of two or more witnesses. That's the template. That's the principle. That by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So, verse 15, go to the person alone. If he hears and receives it, you've won your brother, it's, it's done. If he doesn't, then you have to go to verse 16, step two. And you have to bring in two or three witnesses that every word would be established. And verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church, speaking of the leadership, this is church discipline, but if he refuses even to hear the church, this is pretty strong. Let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Wow. Wow. Treat them like you would an IRS agent who's auditing you. <laughs> Is that bad? It's, it's after April 15th, right? So anyway, unless you filed an extension. Listen to Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Echoes the same thing. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them, and here's why. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful, they are self-condemned. By the way, when we get towards the end of the chapter and this series, we're going to be reminded of what Paul did. He did exactly this in his first epistle when he said to the Corinthians, you think you're so loving? 
Oh, look at us. We're so loving. We accept everybody. So much so that they were accepting and tolerating a man who was having sex with his stepmom under the banner of love. And what does Paul do? He says, that's not love. You know what love is? Love is, and that's where the famous love chapter came. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is what love is, Corinth. That's not love. You know what love would be? Love is for you to kick him out of the church and give him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. <laughs> Whoa. That's love? Yeah. That doesn't feel like it's very loving. It is. If you really care about this guy, you need to do that. And what happens? They do it to their credit. And as we'll talk about at the end of the chapter, he's restored. He's restored. And then it's kind of interesting because in 2 Corinthians, Paul has to rebuke them because they were still being too harsh with him. He said, forgive him already. Restore him already. He's repented already. It worked. You gave him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh because you loved him. That's true love. That's what true love does. That's what true love is. And it worked. He repented. And then we're having a hard time restoring him. Listen, if you hear nothing else that I say today in our 2 Corinthians study, please hear this. We are never to do this in an unloving manner. We are never to do this in an unloving manner. I want to read Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and in so doing, I think it'll explain in large measure why it is that not only do we speak the truth because we love, but we have to speak the truth in a very loving way. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, should restore that person, key word, gently, gently, kindly, softly. The proverb says a, a, a gentle word breaks a bone. A gentle word cuts to the quick. When I was growing up, my mom used to scream at me. I was such a bad, rotten kid. And I just drove her crazy. And she would scream in that voice with her thick accent, Wahido! Wahido! And that's all I really heard was that when she would hit a certain tone and tune and tempo, I just went, you know, blank. I mean, I just... I didn't hear anything. But when she would talk to me in a soft voice, it hit me. I know I've shared this before, and I know it, it's going to date me and most of you here today as well, but you remember that shampoo commercial from, I think this was back in the 70s, and it went something like this. If you want to get somebody's attention, whisper. <laughs> Look at you. You're all like, what? He's whispering. <laughs> Maybe you should do that more often, Pastor, because you're up there yelling all the time. <laughs> Sorry. It's from my childhood. <laughs> if you want to get somebody's attention, whisper. That's what the Proverbs is saying. You want to get somebody's attention. You want to speak truth to somebody. Do it gently. Do it softly. Do it lovingly. But 
watch yourselves. Or you also may be tempted. Oh, interesting. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And then he says this. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. There is such a thing as being self-deceived. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. This is really what Jesus was saying about removing first the log in your own eye before you confront the speck in your brother's eye? Why is it that our sin always looks so much worse on somebody else? And by the way, how do you know that I have a speck in my eye were it not for that beam in your eye from which the speck in my eye came? We say it this way. Takes one to know one. Example. Someone says, Pastor J.D., you're so full of pride. Huh? How do you know what pride looks like? Except that you possess it in your life. It takes one to know one. <laughs> That's the pot calling the kettle black. Me, what about you? Reminds me of what Stanley Volk, who's now with the Lord, said when, after a sermon he preached, a member of his church came up to him afterwards and said, Brother, you're so full of pride. To which he responded, Brother, you don't know the half of it. That's a great answer. In fact, if you ever say that to me, you'll never do it now, right? But if you ever say that to me, that's how I'm going to answer you. You don't know the half of it. You don't know the half of it. Well, let me bring it to a close, and I'll do so by posing two questions, and please know that I ask myself these questions as it relates to my willingness to speak the truth in love. Here's the first question. Do I, in my self-love, care more about the other person still liking me than I do about them and the destructive path that they're on? Here's the second question. Am I willing to offend someone into heaven or am I instead only flattering them into hell because of my unwillingness to speak the truth to them in my love for them. I want to close with A.W. Tozier. For those of you who know A.W. Tozier and are familiar with his writings, you, like me, probably have a love-hate relationship uh, with his bluntness. <laughs> I mean, here's a guy who tells it like it is. I remember many years ago in my devotions, I was really uh, reading a lot of A.W. Tozier, and I, I finally one day, I just said, you know what? I, I closed the, <laughs> the Tozier devotional. I said, I, gotta, I, I need a break for just a, a, just a couple weeks. I'm starting to question whether or not I'm still saved after reading this guy sometimes, you know? I mean, just hit head on. Listen to what he says. I preach to my congregation week after week. And I pray that I may be able to preach with such convicting power that my people will sweat. Yeah, that's why, by the way, we have the AC so cold, so that... <laughs> he says this, I do not want them to leave my services feeling good. <laughs> 
the last thing I want to do is to give them some kind of religious tranquilizer and let them go to hell in their relaxation. Wow. The Christian church was designed to make sinners sweat. I have always believed that, and I still believe it. The messages preached in our churches should make backslidden Christians sweat. And if I achieve that objective when I preach, I thank God with all of my heart, no matter what people think of me. There's a little bit of the Apostle Paul in that, isn't there? Would to God that we would be numbered amongst those who love enough, care enough to speak the truth into the life of another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I thank you for the strength of this passage. I thank you for the example in the Apostle Paul of a man who really loves, who really loves people and cares about people. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be given permission and unfettered access to our hearts as you search our hearts concerning this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.